Hey guys, welcome to another Elvistory reaction and review video. And this video will be about my personal uh, favorite Elvis documentary of all time, really. I mean, there's a bunch of them out there that I've seen that I really, really like. But personally, for me, um, this one was my favorite because it really concentrates on who Elvis was as a person. And, you know, you see a lot of uh, Elvis documentaries out there and they all tend to uh, lead to the same thing, you know, what happened at, you know, towards the end of his life, you know, things that went wrong, you know, why this, and, and the focus seems to go in negative areas a lot of times. So, in that sense, um, this is why this documentary, uh, one of the reasons why this documentary is my favorite, because it doesn't focus on <clears throat> all that stuff, all the negative stuff, you know, it, it, it you know, pushes that aside and it, it focuses more on who Elvis really was as a person, uh, despite any problems he had. You know, it's a uh, breath of fresh air, really, to to see uh, a documentary like this. So that's why it's really my favorite. I mean, I know you guys have probably uh, seen this documentary before. It's called um, Elvis, A Generous Heart, and it was uh, done in 2007, I believe. And, you know, I've seen it many times and I'm sure you, most of you might have already, but, you know, I thought this would be, uh, you know, out of a lot of the reaction videos I've been doing, I really couldn't wait to do this one because um, I really, you know, on this channel, I try my best. I mean, I know once in a while it comes up, you know, negative things come up and they just have to be discussed. But I try not to focus in that area on this channel. And, you know, most of you guys probably noticed that already. So um, that's why one of the reasons why I thought this would be, you know, a great thing for this channel. This would be a great reaction video to do, even though it's a little bit on the long side. You know, if you guys want to watch it in increments, if you guys... <laughs> If you guys want to uh, watch half of it and go back later, you know, do what you got to do. But um, even though it's a long video, it really, really touches on really just, you know, who Elvis was as a person, you know. And I think there needs to be more of a focus on that, you know, rather than what led to his demise, blah, 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 you know, the addictions, blah, 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 blah. It needs to be more of a focus on the good person that he was. Because to me, in my opinion, I've said this before, that supersedes any, you know, uh, faults that a person may have. Is what's really true in their heart. In, in Ellis' heart, he was, he was a really good, generous, kind person. And this video uh, really, really shows that. So, all right, guys. So... Without any further ado, we will get to the video, and I hope you guys enjoy it, and I will see you guys there in a couple of seconds. Okay, guys, so once again, this is Elvis, A Generous Heart, documentary uh, from the year 2007. Hope you guys enjoy it. We were in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, he got word that a little boy in the hospital was dying and uh, that he wanted to see, see Elvis and he couldn't make it to the show. He was, he was too sick to get to the show. And uh, so uh, we loaded up in, in, in cars and we went to the hospital. And Elvis was wearing, uh, Elvis met, met this little boy and talked to him and, 
and uh, he was wearing a, a cross that was made of garnets. And um, he took it off and he gave it to this child. And it was a real touching, touching moment. Just uh, an hour or so before the show. Wow. When Elvis started getting that money and it started becoming, he wanted to share it. He was a sharing person. And his dad got in early confrontations with him about giving so much away. Uh, you know, son, he, he would say, son, you know, we're pretty wealthy. Man, you're giving people houses. And you're giving guys on television, you don't even know Cadillacs. And people that walk off the street in a dealership, you buy them a Cadillac. And, and uh, pretty soon, the, the bank account is going to get a little, is going to take a, a hit. And Elvis would say, look, dad, he said, look, I enjoy giving stuff away to people. So that's how I get my enjoyment. He said, uh, I can go out and do a tour. He said, I can do a tour in six weeks and make $2 million. He said, I'm not worried about money. He said, I want, I want to make people happy. When my wife was, gosh, nine or 10, and her sister was maybe a couple of years older than that, uh, they would uh, go down to Graceland and uh, in, just in the hopes of seeing Elvis. And they would go down there almost every weekend, Saturday or Sunday. And many times he would actually come down to the gate and put his hands through the gate and shake hands and talk to people. And, and he did it often. Sometimes he did it by himself. And that just made their day, you know. And it just, again, shows the type of person that he is, that, uh, that he would do that. And uh, back then he had, he had that sort of devotion in his fan base. And those people have gotten older, but they're still devoted to him. And their kids are now big fans, and their grandkids are now big fans. And so it just says a lot for what he has done and the influence that he's had. For all of Elvis Presley's accomplishments, I think his greatest joy, other than Lisa Marie, was giving to others. He loved to see the smiles and, and the looks on people's faces when he gave them things. The true measure of a man's success is not what he achieves and acquires for himself in his lifetime, but what of himself he gives to others. Elvis Presley touched the lives of millions and millions of people the world over. With his music, his movies, and his live performances, Elvis brought joy to the hearts of people everywhere. And even today, over three decades after his untimely death, Elvis's music and his legacy continue to have a lasting and profound impact on music and popular culture around the world. I think Elvis did so much over such a period. That's such a true point. I mean, look at, I mean, this was done in uh, 2007, this documentary. And uh, here we are 16 years later, 2023. And it, it's just amazing. Elvis's legacy just keeps growing and growing and growing. And, you know, at one point when Elvis was here, his one of his biggest concerns were that after he was gone, that he would be forgotten. And, oh, my God, he couldn't have been more wrong about that. Because look at look how his legacy just keeps growing. It's amazing. There's a time that he's just transcended any any kind of you know other artists, such as uh, not just music artists, uh, entertainers and actors. And you know, it's, it's hard to tell a kid, though, you know, why they should like Elvis. You know, I think uh, you see kids who actually see Elvis and hear his music, who like it just for what it is, you know. It's just him. He's sold more music than anybody else in the world. He's sold more music since he died than anybody else in the world. And that's phenomenal. I think it's, you know, I'm not exactly sure about the amounts, but it's like he's had 60 or 70 gold and platinum records since he passed away. That's phenomenal, but still, it's not that so much it's the music, it's the man. Uh, they loved his early music, and his fans will buy anything that's put out about Elvis. Who else can do that? I mean, there's no one else that can do that, and there's no one else ever been able to do that. That's right. He, he was a pioneer. He was a trailblazer. There was no book. There was no video or no DVD that you could go to and say, well, this is how you become a rock and roll star. There wasn't that because he was a little rockabilly star. His manager comes along, Colonel Parker, and says, Elvis, what do you really want to do? He says, well, I want to you know, be a major recording star, but also want to do movies. He said, okay, I'll fix it up for you. Well, the Colonel gets Elvis from Sun Records over to RCA Records, gets him a deal, 
and then Elvis, he gets Elvis into Hollywood, into movies, gets him on Nash t national television. Well, until like John Lennon said, until Elvis, there was nothing. So when these people are growing up and they're 12, 13, 14, 15, they're highly impressed. And because in his, this guy, he was the total package. I know it's a, a phrase that's used today, but he was the original American Idol. He was the world idol, if you will, because he could not only he could sing, but he could sing five different types of music. He could sing rock and roll. He could sing pop. He could sing country and western. He could sing gospel. He could sing rhythm and blues. There's not a singer on this earth today that can sing all those five music. Some of them can really sing great one or two, but not all five. That's right. And yet, for all Elvis's phenomenal success as an entertainer, perhaps the king's most endearing quality and the greatest of his legacies was his enormous generosity to others who were less fortunate than he was. I always felt like um, he tried to give back to his fans more than he took from them. And when, um, whenever he gave a, a piece of jewelry away, on the, like on the stage, when he'd take off a ring and, get, and hand it to a, to a fan, um, it was just an act of love on his part. He just loved his fans, and, and they're, they're, what made him, they're what made him work and why he worked. Why he worked so hard was his fans. He loved his fans. He liked to see the enjoyment. Because when, they, when a guy gives you a new Cadillac or gives you a house or gives you a free trip to Hawaii, you become elated. And that made him feel good. He didn't play golf, he didn't fish, he didn't hunt, all that stuff. And to give stuff away and make people happy, that's what he enjoyed. There can be no question that Elvis Presley was one of the most influential people in the cultural history of America. His talent, good looks, sensuality, charm, and charisma endeared him to a vast legion of fans around the world. Not surprisingly, his popularity and stature continue to grow. With a sound and style that combined his many musical influences, he challenged the social and racial barriers of his time and changed forever the worlds of music and popular culture in America. He was exposed to the Bill Street rhythm and blues music. And so when he combined, like Elvis said, when he combined that along with gospel, it came out rock and roll. And you know that's just the way he was brought up. When you talk to Uncle Sam, and we used to go over to Uncle Sam's house, he used to grill hamburgers out for us and you know, things like that. And you'd hear him talk and things like that. Say in the 60s, for some of you guys that don't know who, uh, <clears throat> this is Sam Phillips um, that used to own Sun Records, where Elvis ma uh, made his first song. Um, this is Sam Phillips' nephew, in case you guys were wondering who this was. Yeah, I think he definitely realized what he what he was doing and and what a statement he had made with Sun Records. Uh, but when we first started, I think he just was wanting to cut good music. I mean, he just wanted to record great music. I mean, he wasn't trying to change the world at that time. Uh, if you look at the first music he recorded, it was mostly uh, blues. I mean, few people know he first recorded B.B. King, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, uh, Bobby Bland, you know, right. uh, Rufus Thomas. Hardly anyone really knows that except the true fan of Sun Records. And then, then Elvis popped up, and it was those same guys, except it was a white guy. And he could sing just like they could. But I still didn't think he had any, he wasn't trying to do anything but really cut really good records. You know, it's, it's what's in the grooves. It's always been what's in the grooves. And if it's in the groove, it's, that's all he cared about. And Uncle Sam was able to take that raw sound and somehow fill it up to make it sound like it was so much more than what it was. And, and if you've ever been into uh, 706 Union, it's a small place. So it, it gives you, not only was he a, a genius producer, but he was a hell of an engineer to be able to get the sound that he did out of that studio. Presley, in my opinion, was a person probably with as much talent vocally that could be used with so many different types of songs as I've ever heard of in my life. He didn't follow any one path. He didn't just sing rock and roll for that rhythm and blues country. He sang pop. He, and when you can do that and give it an unbelievable, credible, creditable uh, interpretation, 
there's something to be said for him. Very few of us could do it. I had a feeling from the very beginning that he had unusual raw, real raw talent, and that's that's what I like. The, the, the raw, the better, if you had the basics. I felt that if there was anybody that could do an amalgamation of rhythm and blues or race music, as they called it back in the 50s and 40s, and country music, and come out with something that was, well, it wasn't even named at the time. People not only enjoyed his work as an artist, but they believed him in, in him as an individual. And also, I think to know that he basically did not change a lot so far as his relations with people. Just the ordinary person on the street was something absolutely imperative to his unbelievable success. When Elvis walked out of the Sun Studios on July 5, 1954, he never could have known that within a very short time, he would become one of the most influential and beloved Americans of the 20th century. Even in his wildest dreams, he could never have imagined what he would accomplish in a short but truly remarkable life. He knew you had to look different, he knew you had to act different, he knew you had to dress different, he knew you had to talk different. He had all that worked out in his own mind. He was very, he was very observant. He, he would study movie stars, how they acted, and he studied like Clark Gable left his shirt open and didn't wear a t-shirt. He studied like how Jimmy Dean and Brando wouldn't smile in their publicity pictures, and in his early pictures he wouldn't do that. He's a pretty sharp guy, very observant. He had studied other entertainers. He'd observed how they handled people, how they were nice about signing autographs, how they were nice about shaking hands, how they were nice about taking pictures with people. And he said, if I ever make it, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be as nice as I possibly can. He was ready when the break came for him to be a superstar. And he was prepared. But the secret was he loved being Elvis Preston. He loved it. Early in Elvis's career, his manager, the controversial Colonel Tom Parker, made good use of the relatively new medium of television and as with everything Elvis did in the entertainment business, his TV appearances made history. Elvis made his national television debut in 1956 on Stage Show, a weekly series hosted by Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey. He followed this with two appearances on The Milton Berle Show. This is the first time that the Hancock is going to rock and roll while still at anchor. Here's a young man who in a few short months has gained tremendous popularity in the music business. His records are really gone like wildfire. He's America's new singing sensation, our new RCA recording artist. Here he is, a big reception for Elvis Presley! <laughs> in his second performance on The Burl oh, Show, yeah. Elvis did a version of Hound Dog that was, for the time, so provocative that it caused a national scandal. Elvis then appeared on The Steve Allen Show, with Allen mocking the sensation of The Burl Show by having Elvis dress in a tuxedo and perform Hound Dog to an actual Basset Hound. After his appearance on The Allen Show, Elvis did a short interview with High Gardner for the program High Gardner Calling. Hello? Did you have fun tonight on the Steve Allen Show? Yes, sir. I really did. I really enjoyed it. First time you mm. ever worked in uh, tux or tails? Uh, it's the first time I ever had one on, period. What do you uh, keep in mind mostly? I mean, uh, some of the songs you're going to do or, or, or some of your plans or, or what? What, what? What goes through you? I don't mean to interrupt, guys, but um, of course... You know, as everybody knows now, it's a really <clears throat> uh, popular thing that uh, actually Elvis really uh, walking away from the Steve Allen show, he was angry that he uh, was put through that, really. And they kind of made a mockery of him, more or less. But, you know, Elvis being as polite as he was, um, wasn't going to go on any interview or say anything negative in public about Steve Allen or the show because you know that would reflect negatively on him and he knew that but as we all know nowadays deep down inside as it came out over the years Elvis even admitted that you know 
he, you know, that really upset him. What they did to him with the hound dog and making him sing to an actual hound dog. That was something in his career that he just soon forget about. Mind. Well, uh, everything has happened to me so fast in the last year and a half till, uh, uh, I'm all mixed up, you know, I mean, I can't keep up with everything that's happening. The reigning king of television at that time was Ed Sullivan with his Sunday night variety show. Sullivan had said he would never, under any circumstances, have the controversial Elvis on his show. Mm. But after Elvis appeared on the Steve Allen show, Allen's ratings surpassed Sullivan for the first time, and Sullivan agreed to book Elvis. Yeah, of course he did. Sullivan paid Elvis $50,000 to make three appearances, which was, at that time, more money than any performer had ever been paid to appear on a network variety show. Elvis's third appearance on The Sullivan Show came in 1957. And this was the show in which Elvis was shown on camera only from the waist mm. up, one of television history's most memorable moments. In 1958, Elvis was drafted into the army. Even his detractors admired Elvis for doing his patriotic duty and not using his fame and fortune to somehow avoid his army service. That's right. Elvis was discharged from the service in 1960. Elvis, do you think the uh, music has changed since you've been out of the service? I mean, since you've been in the service? Possibly, yes. <clears throat> I, I, I can't say, really. I haven't been here long enough to even know. The, Sorry. Excuse me. Right. Sorry. <laughs> the, the only thing I can say is that uh, uh, if it has changed, well, I would be foolish not to try to change with it, you know. But as of now, I have no reason to, to, to change anything. Shortly after his discharge from the Army, Elvis once again made television history when he appeared on the Frank Sinatra show. Sinatra gave his show a welcome back Elvis theme to herald the King's return from the Army. Elvis was paid $125,000 to appear, again setting a television record for the time. You know, I was wondering, as a matter of fact, while you were singing, Elvis, I thought to myself, I wonder what would have happened if I had recorded uh, Love Me Tender instead of you. I wouldn't have made any difference. I think it would, about uh, two million records less. <laughs> <laughs> smarty. No one had an impact as, like Elvis had. I mean, Sinatra, as a music man, was just fantastic. Elvis is just an icon. And it's just one of these things, you know, That's it's right. just some people have a, a charisma about them. Some people have something that you can't get out of your mind and he was like that and it was it was for everybody and I see it all the time uh, you know grandkids I have a grandkid who's 13 years old and and she's uh, you know she asks about it she, she'll see something on TV and she'll wonder what's going on you know why is going on with Elvis who is Elvis now of course she knows because she's here but she doesn't understand she just knows the name it's almost like he's still alive Elvis is a Appearance on the Sinatra show was the last time Elvis appeared on television for eight long years. In the following eight years, all Elvis did was make movies and release soundtrack albums. Elvis made 33 films in all, and every movie he starred in was a box office success. Critics have often dismissed Elvis's films as formulaic and lightweight. In truth, most of his movies were not what anyone would consider classics. Nonetheless, starring in 33 consecutive hit films is an accomplishment not even the biggest stars in film history can lay claim to. And this screen success only proves that Elvis was, by any measure, the biggest and brightest star in the history of American popular culture. Between 1960 and 1968, despite the continuing success of his films, Elvis did no concert tours and did not appear on television. With the emergence of the Beatles and the British invasion that followed, popular music was going through radical changes, and Elvis himself had doubts as to whether or not his music and style were still appealing and relevant to young people. I think that the only time that Elvis had any confidence issues was in the 1960s. Sure, he was still a star, he was still making movies, he was still a box office attraction, he was selling records. I mean, there was no problem there, 
but there was something else on the horizon. It was the British invasion. And Elvis really started to feel a little self-doubt. In 1968, for the NBC network, Elvis made what has come to be known in musical history as the comeback special. This show, simply titled Elvis, was and remains one of the most critically acclaimed musical specials of all time. The success of this show gave Elvis the confidence he needed to once again start performing, both live and on television. Elvis decided to go on tour again. It was the first time since 1957 that Elvis played live shows. Between 1969 and 1977, Elvis gave nearly 1,100 live performances all across the country. He did that 68 special, and the ratings were terrific. So he knew the light was still burning, the fire was still there, but he wasn't sure about a live audience. So when he did that opening in Vegas, he was quite nervous. And he told us, he said, guys, he said, I don't know how I'm going to go over. But we were trying to build up his conference. Oh, but you're going to be great. Oh, but you're going to knock him dead. You got that look. You still got those looks. You got that stage performance in you. And we know that you're going to sing your back kind off. You're going to really sing your can off. And Elvis, that's all you can do. If they like you, they like you. If they don't, they don't. But Elvis, I guarantee you, they're going to like you. And when he walked out on that stage, and that room was full of a lot of tough people. There was a lot of stars there. There were a lot of critics there. A lot of people who came to see if he still had it or not. They were well connected in show business. And he just blew them all away. From that moment on, he knew he was back. It was in 1973 that Elvis made TV history again. His Elvis, Aloha from Hawaii concert via satellite, was seen in 40 countries by close to 1.5 billion people. In fact, it was seen on television in more American homes than man's first walk on the moon. The difference in Elvis and everyone else was that, um, that he obviously um, loved his fans and cared for his fans and um, I just he was so he was so honest you just didn't doubt that he was he was pure as a driven snow I don't think his fans saw him as out to sell a ticket to his show he was he was there to entertain them he never had any money he gave all his money away to other people he was just a good, good person, and people knew that. Despite all his unprecedented and monumental success as a singer, performer, in movies and on television, the one thing that gave Elvis his greatest joy in life was giving to others. Perhaps this, above all else, is the king's greatest legacy, his giving heart and the enormous generosity he showed throughout his life. It's not cool then in Mississippi, you know, and he let this black kid share some of his ice cream. But that's just a, a, a small example of how it all started with him. He, he, he was a sharing person. As a teenager, Elvis worked at a variety of jobs before his music career began. He worked as a movie usher and saved every cent he could to buy his parents a picture of Jesus. He once said, it was the most favorite gift he had ever given to anybody. Even though Elvis went on to achieve incredible fortune and fame, he never ever forgot what it was like to be poor. He was extremely generous to many, many people. The big TCB ring that he's so famous for wearing that he made, you know, I made that ring. Um, it, took me, it took me three tries to make that ring. The first ring I made 
uh, the first ring I made, he gave away. And where it went, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, but the idea was he wanted a stage ring. He wanted a flashy big ring that would say, that's Elvis Presley's ring. So uh, the second ring I made was a large horseshoe ring that he wore in, in Hawaii. And uh, he gave, ended up giving that ring away. He said, it's still in what I want. So the next ring I designed, the TCB ring. I actually made the ring out of balsa wood, out like you would make a model airplane. And I, I, I carved it out of balsa wood, I, I sawed out the letters, I made the entire ring out of balsa wood, hand painted it with airplane dope and put rhinestones in it, took it out there, he said, this is exactly what I want. So then I made the original ring and um, when I when I when I when I gave it to him, when I presented it to him, um, it was it was so it was so it's so gorgeous. The ring is so magnificent that I wanted it to, to to really show off. So I asked him to come downstairs to his dining room table, which is this wonderful Waterford chandelier hanging over it, you know. And uh, so I opened the ring box, took it out, put it on his finger. He just went bonkers. I never seen him as excited about anything as he was. He, he just went crazy and, and uh, he said, I want to do something for you. I know how hard you've worked to do this ring. So what can I do for you? I said, well, I'd like to have that Lincoln you got parked out front. He said, <laughs> oh man, that car is a house. That is my car. And I said, I know, that's why I want it. And he said, well, you know what? You earned it, you can have it. In the South, a lot, everybody mostly came in the back door, especially at Graceland. And the only guy, people that parked in front of Graceland was him. He had a key to the house. We didn't have a key to the house. So we'd park in the back and come in the back door. Now the media later on called it the jungle room. We never called it that. We just called it the den off the kitchen. So I'm walking up, and there's plate glass there. And one of the guys, they told me about this later. One of the guys said, hey Elvis, here comes GK. He said, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah, okay. He said, but Elvis, it's his birthday. And Elvis said, what, it's his birthday? He said, yeah. He said, well look, I just bought this ring at Thunderbird Jewelers in Vegas, but I want El I want GK to have it. While I detain him, I'll engage him in some kind of conversation. You guys run up to my room, it's in my jewelry case. It's a green emerald with 21 diamonds and 18 gold diamonds, 18 karat gold. Somehow get it in a box and slip it up and give it to me. So I'll walk in, we start talking, I said, hey, I said, let me ask you, get this out of the way, because I'll sit around and be nervous about asking. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, Elvis, the radio station wants to know, they're gonna do this promo, if you can do like a drop for him or Cut, cut this liner thing for him. And I said, I was, before you even answer, I know that you got a contract with RCA. And I said, I know you can't do it. And I didn't get the rest of the sentence out. And he said, shut up. I said, what? And he took his arm around, swung it around. <laughs> and somehow one of the guys had snuck up behind him and slipped it in his hand. And he came around with it and he said, happy birthday. And I said, what? He said, open that up. And I opened it up and there was this ring was in there. I said, Elvis, you son of a gun. And he said, yeah, he said, GK, I just want you to have it. Mm -hmm. Elvis also displayed enormous compassion for those who were sick or in need of medical assistance. Elvis always remembered the vulnerability of illness and death from his own life. On January 8, 1935, in that small two-room house in Tupelo, Mississippi, Gladys Presley gave birth to the twins she had been carrying. Jesse Garen Presley was born dead. 35 minutes later, his twin brother, Elvis Aaron Presley, was born at 4.35 a.m. Elvis then spent the first few weeks of his life in the charity ward of a Mississippi hospital. The loss of his twin brother, Jesse, had a profound effect on Elvis and how he perceived life. Studies of twins whose siblings had died in utero or in the early stages of life indicate that a significant and prolonged experience of loss remains in the surviving twin. Oftentimes, the surviving twin will question, why wasn't it me that died? Or did I do something to make him die? They often feel guilty about their own survival. For Elvis, this feeling of guilt only increased as he achieved incredible fame and fortune. Parents, too, have a sense of guilt when one twin dies and often overcompensate to the surviving twin. Through her grief, Gladys Presley saw Elvis's survival as an omen, a sign that he was destined for greatness. His mother was a wonderful, wonderful lady. She was the sunshine of his life. It rose and set in her. 
Uh, he worshiped the ground she walked on. Sure, he loved his daddy, but his mother was the one. And I was very, very close to his mother. And if she liked you, boom, it was all over with Elvis. He automatically, even though if he liked you, he really liked you. It was mom because he thought she was a great judge of character and a great judge of people, which she was. She had that instinct that guys come around, came around. She said, Elvis, that guy's phony. Elvis, that guy's for real, you know. She could do that, and she was right. In many ways, both Gladys and Elvis continually felt tremendous loss and vulnerability because of Jesse's death. Elvis and his mother were very, very close. And of course, Elvis himself was completely devastated by his mother's death from heart failure in 1958. Had she lived, he would be alive today. She had a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, thing over him whereby he, everything she said was law. It, there was no arguments, there was no confrontation, there was no debate, there was no discussions. If she said, Elvis, I really wish you wouldn't fly, wouldn't fly. She said, Elvis, I really wish you wouldn't hang out with that guy. Guy was gone. She said, Elvis, I wish you really wouldn't uh, do this or do that. He wouldn't do it. For Elvis, perhaps it was the memory of his brother Jesse as well as his sense of vulnerability that often inspired him to donate to medical institutions and charities. Elvis knew that his fame could be used to raise money and awareness for charity. He lent his name and image to the American Cancer Society as well as many other charitable causes. He gave blood and got vaccines, all under the watchful eye of photographers and journalists who spread the image of Elvis the man who cares about others and their health. In 1961, Elvis began a yearly Christmas tradition of giving over $100,000 to more than 50 charities. Elvis gave cash to many charities and often donated various personal items and mementos to be auctioned off to raise funds. In 1968, he auctioned off one of his cars, a shiny Rolls Royce, to raise money for a charity that cared for mentally retarded children. Elvis even bought the Franklin D. Roosevelt presidential yacht and donated it to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, which then sold it for $55,000. Elvis rarely publicized his generosity. In fact, the only occasions when he did publicize his charitable work were when the ensuing publicity would aid in raising even more needed funds or awareness. Most times, Elvis chose to give totally anonymously. There were many times when he would read in the newspaper about a person or family who had fallen on hard times or was in desperate need. On these occasions, Elvis would send money to try and help. He paid off people's debts and mortgages and paid for operations or medical care, not only for friends and family, but often for total strangers in desperate need. There is no way to know how many times Elvis did this. But according to friends and family, Elvis did it on many, many occasions. Watching an Elvis concert was memorable in and of itself. There were many live performances. I just wanted to interrupt you. Um, <clears throat> when you talked about um, Christmas, I, I'm re I was reminded of a story that uh, I saw an interview with um, Joe Mascheo, who was in the Imperials, uh, who performed with Elvis, <clears throat> and Joe said um, that Elvis, I think, was around Christmas time, and it wasn't publicized, and only people, <clears throat> like some local people, around where Elvis lived in Memphis, knew about it. Um, Elvis would. Uh, open up his home and certain people were allowed to come in and if they had like stories that were uh, if they were going through hard times uh, anything really if they were out of work or you know any kind of hard time story uh, and they talked to Elvis about it about something they were going through right at that time um, right on the spot he would cut them a check for what he felt was adequate to help them out and this is something he did quite a bit 
and it was around Christmas time and it was not publicized. Performances Elvis gave in his career that were given solely from his heart and to benefit others. In 1956 and again in 1957, Elvis gave concerts in his hometown of Tupelo to raise money for the Elvis Presley Youth Foundation. On March 25, 1961, Elvis performed a benefit concert at the Block Arena at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This performance raised over $65,000 toward the building of the USS Arizona Memorial, which was completed the following year. This donation made Elvis Presley the single biggest individual donor to the Pearl Harbor Memorial. Wow. When Elvis gave his legendary Aloha from Hawaii concert, the sale of souvenirs and related items raised more than $75,000 for the Kulakalani Lee Cancer Foundation. In 1975, Elvis gave a concert in Jackson, Mississippi that raised more than $100,000 for the tornado victims in his home state. As a small child, Elvis survived a killer tornado that had ripped through Tupelo, and so he felt great compassion for the victims of the Jackson tornado. Buying a ticket to an Elvis concert and buying a souvenir were also ways that the King contributed to charity. Quite often, the proceeds from these sales went directly to a designated charitable institution. In 1975, at a concert in Asheville, North Carolina, Elvis took the diamond cross that he wore around his neck and gave it to a five-year-old girl in the audience. On another occasion, Elvis went on stage wearing a huge opal and diamond ring on his finger. This ring was reportedly worth between thirty-five and forty thousand dollars. During the concert, Elvis saw a little girl in the front row who was sitting in a wheelchair. He took the ring off his finger and gave it to the little girl. There was no publicity about this, just the enormous satisfaction that Elvis got from seeing the look on the little girl's face. Indeed, Elvis gave away so much jewelry that he even traveled with his personal jeweler, Lowell Hayes, who brought along portable jewelry cases with him. A friend took me out to meet Elvis uh, in November of 1968. And uh, when I met Elvis, he was, uh, he was, it was raining the night I met Elvis. He was in his backyard wearing a full-length mink coat with a hood on it, shooting a pistol at a target on the side of his daddy's office. The sheriff of Shelby County was teaching him how to, or instructing him in how to shoot his pistol, which I think he already knew how to do. <laughs> Over a period of the next year, I went to movies uh, with him um, and just kind of got to know him. And then in December of the next year, he uh, called me on Christmas Eve and wanted to do his Christmas shopping at about, uh, 10 or 11 o'clock at night and uh, I took a, br a briefcase of jewelry to the Memphian Theater. Uh, I went in and, and, and they, they, they told Elvis that Lowell's here and uh, he got up and we went back to the men's room and uh, it's an old story but it's a true story. Elvis um, opened one of the stalls, folded down the toilet seat, sat down on the seat and said put your briefcase on my lap. Set my briefcase on his lap and opened it up and he went through my jewelry and selected very carefully uh, pieces of jewelry for his, for his friends and his family, his uh, aunt and uh, his dad and other members of his family. <laughs> and uh, from then on, um, I was Elvis's jeweler. Whenever he wanted anything, he called me. Middle of the night or whenever it was, he called me. The first time I sold Elvis jewelry, I sold him jewelry out of, a, out of an old Samsonite case and my brother said, you know what, if you're going to sell Elvis jewelry, you could have a nice briefcase. So he goes out and buys me, a, at that time, a $250 all leather, wonderful briefcase, which was a lot of money back back then. Well, um, it had a combination lock, and Elvis Elvis uh, uh, called me one time. At, uh, I was on tour, and uh, well, when I would go, when I would go, I would fly in and out of the tours. I had a business to run in Memphis, so I'd, and I always had a room in the hotel so it didn't matter whether, I, you know, I just got fly in, there was my room uh, in, on the floor with Elvis. So 
when I fly in, the first thing I have is a briefcase of the $200,000 worth of jewelry in it that I've got to figure out what, if I'm going to have any fun, I've got to make sure this thing is secure first, so I would take it and give it to Elvis. Well, uh, he, and he'd keep it, and if he wanted something, he'd call me, and, uh, and I'd, go, I'd go open it up, and, and he'd get what he wanted. Well, one time he called me, and, and uh, he said, Lowell, he said, what's the combination to your briefcase? So I told him the combination was my birthday, and uh, so he opened the briefcase and he bought, he, there was something going on, he needed something right then, you know. That's how he was. And, uh, and so uh, then later I found out that he had torn the tag off and put it in the case. And I said, well, that's not a problem. No, don't worry about it. It's, everything's fine. So from then on, whenever I would check into a tour or out of a tour, and this went on for several years, I'd give him my case. And, and, and most of the time he wouldn't call me. He'd just open that case up and he'd get something out tear off the tag, throw it in the case, and when I get back to Memphis, I send him a bill. <laughs> so it was just the most phenomenal thing, you know, it was, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> Elvis reportedly wow. bought close to $700,000 worth of jewelry in the last five years of his life, most of which he gave away. Wow. I was sitting by the stage and uh, he came over to me and he says, Where I noticed more, mainly older guys drive Cadillacs, and there's a reason behind that, he said. He was pretty observant, like I said. He said that, you know, when you, when you get a job and you start working, you start saving your money. And if you do pretty good, and you save enough money, then you can buy a Cadillac. But it's mainly older people have Cadillacs because it takes a while to save that money to buy a Cadillac. So, when Elvis got famous, first one of the first cars he brought was a Cadillac. And uh, so then, when he started sharing the wealth with the guys, he started buying them Cadillacs. Like he'd buy 10 Cadillacs, or he'd buy 10 Lincolns, or he'd buy 10 Mercedes, or whatever. But the point was, he thought it was, they probably couldn't have afford those cars at that age, when you're 27, 28 years old. But it's really sharp the fact that you got one. Elvis believed that everyone would love a Cadillac as much as he did. In 1975, on one buying spree in Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis bought and gave away 13 Cadillacs. Wow. In his lifetime, Elvis gifted close to 200 Cadillacs to friends, family, and total strangers. I was working at a local Memphis radio station, and I was getting ready to go on the air. I arrived at the station. I was working like 6 to 10 at night. And uh, I, I walk in the station, and two of Elvis's guys are there, Jerry Schilling, Richard Davis. And I say, hey, what's up, guys? He said, Elvis wants to see you. I said, man, I'm getting ready to go on the air. I just can't leave. You know, you just can't do that. 
They said, well, it's pretty important, GK, it's pretty important. They had Elvis' limousine. I said, you got Elvis' limousine? They said, yeah. I said, what's going on? They said, we don't know, but Elvis wants to see you, man, and you know he don't play practical jokes. I said, okay, so I called the program director. He said, okay, George. He said, tell the guy who's on the air now to just stay there for an hour or so until you can go see what Elvis wants and then come right on back and we'll work it out somehow. I said, okay. So I jump in the back of the limousine and they're, they're in the front of the limousine. I'm in the back. They start driving. Well, they don't go to El Graceland, Elvis's home. They go to downtown Memphis. I said, you're going the wrong way, guys. I said, they said, we know, we know where Graceland is. <laughs> they were kidding me. And I said, well, why are you going downtown? And they said, because uh, Elvis is getting himself a new car and he thought it'd be closer for you to meet him downtown as opposed to driving all the way to Graceland. I said, okay. So we drive up to the Cadillac dealership and it's about 10 days before Christmas and it's dark, it's about seven o'clock at night. And they pull in, I said, man, nobody's here. So well, Elvis has gotta be here somewhere. I said, well, I don't see anybody. Cadillac dealership looks like it's closed to me. So we pull up, we walk up there and lo and behold, the door's open. I said, that's unusual. We walk in, all of a sudden, all of these lights come on. That was like a big production, like all these lights on a movie set come on. And sitting right in the middle of the showroom was a 1968 yellow Cadillac convertible. Well, still, I'm thinking that's the car that Elvis is buying for himself, and he wanted to show it to me or something. So I walk overnight, we call him Ian. I say, hey, what's up? He said, stick out your right hand. I stick out my right hand. And he dropped the keys in there, and he said, Merry Christmas. And he pointed at that car. And I said, Elvis, I said, being in radio and television, I should make an Academy Award winning speech at this moment, but I don't know what you say, nobody's ever given me anything like this. And he put his arm around me, called me GK, and he said, GK, he says, what is fame and fortune that you can't share it with your friends? Those who are close to Elvis describe him with words such as loyal, giving, sincere, generous, spiritual, appreciative, humble, and loving. Elvis took great pleasure in giving gifts to others and watching the expressions on their faces when they received these gifts. He found out from some, his road manager and other guys what this guy liked and what that guy liked. So at Christmas he tried to buy you something that he knew that you, were in, that you liked. He knew I liked watches. He gave me five watches and he had them all engraved. And I had them in my safety deposit box. They say, they say things like, to GK from EP, 10 years. He'd been in the business 10 years in show business. Then one of them says uh, to, to, to George from Elvis, and then one says something about rock and roll, but to GK from EP, and, but he knew I liked watches, and so he gave me those five watches, which I still have hid away in my safety deposit box. But uh, he, he gave me a lot of stuff, man. He gave me, one, one year he gave me a stereo. But the first Christmas in 1957, I was there with him, he gave me a record player. It was like a 45, 78, 33 and a third record player. It's the kind where you open the top up and he autographed and it said, uh, to GK, to GK from Elvis, Christmas 1957. He, he was so generous, man. It was. In many situations, Elvis's heartfelt sensitivity and insight were at the core of his gifts. Jerry Schilling, who was one of Elvis's closest friends since 1954, and later on a part of his entourage, lost his mother when he was only two years old. Jerry went to live with his grandparents and then they died. Elvis felt great compassion for Jerry because he knew that his friend had never really had a stable home or family. Although Elvis grew up poor, he understood the great sacrifices his parents had made to make his life better. He understood the comfort that came with living in a warm and loving home. Because of this understanding and this compassion, Elvis bought his friend Jerry Schilling a house as a surprise gift and told him, Jerry, I know that you never had a home of your own and I wanted to be the guy who gave it to you. El By the way, guys, Jerry Schilling still owns that house to this day, I believe. Um, Elvis gave him the money to buy it in, uh, I think it was 1975. Um, Jerry was trying to come up with the uh, financing to buy the house. And at the time, he was helping Elvis with um, doing that karate documentary that uh, wasn't finished. But uh, and he was really, really 
you know, working hard for Elvis at that point. And so Elvis knew that Jerry was trying to buy uh, this house from his friend uh, Rick Husky. And so without Jerry knowing, uh, Elvis secured the rest of the financing himself with his own money and bought the house for Jerry and then told, a Je then, uh, told Jerry uh, that he had purchased the house for him. And like I said, Jerry still lives in it to this day. I believe it's going on uh, probably 47, 48 years that Jerry has been living in that house. And it's in Los Angeles, California, by the way. place to go and he would almost always call Elvis and uh, either Elvis would come over in, a, in one of his Cadillacs or Elvis's dad Vernon would come over uh, Elvis never got out of the Cadillac but Vernon would come in and and, uh, and I, I remember just one time asking Dewey just before he says is Elvis really out there and uh, and and Dewey would look over at Vernon and, and Mr. Presley would go, yeah, he's out there. But I was too scared to even go ask him you know, to, to say hello. I wasn't going to question him and go into his Cadillac or anything like that. And this happened a number of times that Elvis would send a car over, he would come over, Mr. Presley would come over, and uh, they would take, Dewey would get to go over to Graceland and spend a night or two with Greg Graceland, or they'd give him some money, or they would, they would do something for him. Now, wow. that was at a time when Dewey had no impact on Elvis's career. He wasn't really a DJ that he wouldn't listen to anymore. But it was, it was typical of Elvis and that he didn't forget his friends. He didn't forget the people that, uh, that worked with him, that helped him. And he never forgot Dewey, ever. He always helped Dewey out. He always did things for Dewey. We had a guy in a group named Richard Davis who was kind of sort of, he'd been with Elvis, he'd been in the Memphis Mafia, he'd been Elvis' stand in a bunch of his movies, Memphis guy, was a record promoter, and he was down on his luck. And Elvis heard about it, and he sent for him. He said, Richard, are you down on your luck? It was, holidays were approaching, he said, yeah, Elvis. Elvis gave him a brand new Cadillac convertible and 10,000 cash. He said, maybe this will help you out. Wow. And he said, thanks a lot, Elvis. And then, uh, 
you know, some of the guys, Elvis would give things to guys and they had to sell them because a lot of guys couldn't afford a Cadillac. So they wanted to sell it, get a smaller car, pocket the extra money to, to live on or whatever until they get on their feet. And they said, Elvis, I feel funny about this. You gave me this car, not me, but some of the other guys. And, and I got to sell it to get a smaller car. Like I'm going to drop down from a Cadillac to a Pontiac or a Chevy because, uh, you know, it's more economical and I can use the extra money. But I don't want to hurt your feelings. So Elvis said, look, don't worry about that, man. He said, I'm going to make you happy twice. And the guy said, what do you mean? He said, well, the first time I gave you the car and you did all right, you were very happy. Yeah, yeah. Now you can sell it and you'll be happy again. So I'll make you happy twice. That's okay. Good point. Elvis's great spirit of generosity, giving, and compassion for those less fortunate than him lives on to this day. Many of his over 600 fan clubs devote much of their time and energy to raising money for charitable causes in Elvis's name. Former wife Priscilla Presley and daughter Lisa Marie Presley continue Elvis's philanthropy and honor his memory through the Elvis Presley Foundation. The foundation supports charities and community programs such as Presley Place, which provides homeless families up to one year of rent-free housing, child daycare, career and financial counseling, family management guidance, and other assistance to help people regain their independence and self-esteem. Presley Place is a joint venture between the Elvis Presley Foundation and the Metropolitan Interfaith Association in Memphis, known as MIFA. MIFA serves more than 60,000 people annually with nine wow. programs that sustain the independence of the frail elderly, stabilize and transform families in crisis, and equip teens for success. Wow. In 1983, awesome. the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center was established at the Regional Medical Center in Memphis. It has served over 80,000 level one trauma patients from a six state area. In 1990, a wall of honor was erected at the Elvis Presley Memorial Trauma Center and today has over 300 plaques, each inscribed according to the wishes of the donor. Fans from around the world have utilized this wall of honor to memorialize Elvis Presley and continue the charitable work he so passionately believed in. It is impossible to even imagine a performer having a more profound impact on history than did Elvis Presley. In his 42 years of life, Elvis Presley changed a great deal from the shy country boy who walked into a Memphis recording studio in 1953. But the nation had also changed a great deal because of him. And yet, for all his fame and fortune, at his very core and in his heart, Elvis was always that polite, sincere, humble, warm-hearted, generous country boy who just wanted to sing a song. There are no words that can describe the impact Elvis had and continues to have on popular culture throughout the world. There are no words to fully explain or for one to even comprehend the phenomenal success and riches Elvis attained in his life. But in the end, whether a person has attained great riches and fame or has lived a modest or even poor life, the true measure of a man is his heart. Was he a good person? Was he generous, kind, giving, loving, sincere, humble, and honest? Yep. Did he touch the lives of other people in a good way? Absolutely. Elvis Presley was all these things and so much more. He used his fame and fortune to help others less fortunate than himself. Indeed, there is no greater gift one person can give another in this world than to give of himself. And for all Elvis has given the world through his incredible body of work, his greatest legacy to his millions and millions of fans was his kindness and his generous heart. Okay, guys, that concludes the documentary Elvis, A Generous Heart. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I did. And um, there are just uh, so many stories about how giving really Elvis was in so many ways. Um, you know, just not only to his friends, to 
even to people he really didn't know. I mean, there's countless stories. I know there's one that they didn't mention that um, that I heard about um, just through one of the guys in, in the Memphis Mafia that said um, one time he was at a, uh, a car dealer looking for, for a car for himself and uh, he happened to step outside for a minute and he noticed this lady, this older lady, uh, looking in the window, staring at one of the cars. And he just walked up to her and she was taken back. She was like, oh, you know, my God, <laughs> you know, it's Elvis. And he's like, oh, how you doing today, ma'am? She's like, oh, I'm doing just fine. You know, thank you, Elvis. You know, so he's like, oh, you like that car right there? And, and she... She said, yeah, but that's, you know, I could never afford something like that. So he <clears throat> he didn't say anything to her. He just walked back inside and he bought the car this woman was staring at and brought out the keys to her. And he said, here you go. Now you own that car. And he didn't even know this woman. And that's a true story. That That's a true true story so um it's just things like that and you know there's one story also that i know that he um one time there was these people they had their own business uh i think they were uh i don't know if they were like farmers or what they did but their their truck their main truck broke down and they had all their stuff in it and Elvis pulled over <clears throat> and he got out and offered to help him, you know. You know, how can I help you fix this, your truck? He's like, oh, it's just, I don't know if it can be fixed. It's just, and, and apparently it couldn't be fixed. So Elvis told um, these people to hop in the car with him. He went to the dealership, bought this couple a new truck for their business. You believe that that's the truth these stories are true there's so many stories out there like this that are true that elvis did you know he would just it, it didn't matter if about his celebrity if he saw somebody on the side of the road that needed something he would help them in in any way he could and and you know there's probably stories that you know still to this day that haven't been told of his generosity. I mean, there's the publicized things, and then there's the things that you know you you didn't hear about, like the one I mentioned that Christmas time that he used to open up his house, and he would help people out. You know, uh, if they were having a hard time with something, he would cut them a check right on the spot. Here, go take care of your your rent. Here, go take care of uh, your mortgage payment that's a true story he would do that during christmas time at his house and only uh people in the local area where elvis lived knew about it so these are just you know untold things that weren't publicized that elvis you know that's just how he was you know it, it, it was it was real you know that's how elvis the person really was you know um and I've said it before, every person has their faults. But I always believe you don't measure a person by their faults. You measure them by how they treat the people around them, how they treat their family. And, you know, the amount of really good that they do in their lifetime. That's what you measure a person by, not by their faults. That's why I always say videos like this about Elvis the person need to be made more you know that that bring out his you know uh I mean people know about his generosity but they need to know <clears throat> more about who he was as a person you know despite his faults because um magazines and certain <clears throat> things videos that I've seen they tend to dwell on that negative stuff and you know it just doesn't for all he did to help people and entertain us for all he did you know those kinds of things doesn't help him out 
it doesn't help his legacy out. I, I don't see how it does. We all know what happened. We all know the struggles he went through, you know, within himself. We all know about those things. Let's bring about the things that, you know, we don't hear so much about, like the good person that was inside of him through good times, through bad times, you know, he always remained that same person. You know, he never strayed from being a generous person or somebody that would help you, you know, in any way he could. That that was him from beginning to end, you know. And uh, that, like I said, that really needs to be focused on more as far as Elvis Presley's legacy goes. About who he, you know, was as a person. Because that's who he really was. Okay? So... All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I know it was a little bit on the long side. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got to see, you know, just maybe a little bit more about who Elvis was, you know, as a human being. So thanks again, guys, for watching. Uh, thank you for subscribing. If you haven't, please do. Uh, if you get done and you like this video, please hit that like button. It really helps me out. Um, and if you're not getting notifications about my video, just go into your subscriptions next to my channel, tap that bell, and you'll be notified every time I put up a video. So I hope you're all doing great. Thanks again for watching. And as always, TCB, and God bless.